Uh, this is a seven day celebration, uh, which begins the day after Christmas, December 26. Uh, I, I always get a kick out of folk uh, who whine and complain, who say this is a made up holiday. Um, all holidays are made up. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I, I always get a kick out of that. One. I'm sure I'm sure that one also uh, gets you to laughing and chuckling as well. Well, I, I don't spend any time on it because it takes time away from talking about what the holiday is, since everybody knows anything that we do has been thought about and we do it. Some people do less thought. I did a lot. This is a result of intellectual uh, research of many cultures, many languages, and putting this together as an intellectual project. So it's not an invention. It is a creation, an intellectual creation. And people have to get used to that. A, a lot of times people don't see Black people as creating, right? There's the intellectual creation. And we just have to deal with that. But I don't like to spend a lot of time with that, uh, Roland. I'd like to talk about the philosophy behind Kwanzaa, which is Kawaida, about what it means, the theme for this uh, year, uh, which has to do with practicing uh, Kwanzaa and the seven principles, ensuring the well-being of the world. What a beautiful topic to talk about in this day when there's so much trouble, COVID pandemic, the attacks on democracy and our voting rights, right? Uh, war and conflict everywhere, failing economies, right? Massive immigration and uh, population displacement. Those are things that we have to deal with and we can't deal with frivolities, right? Some things aren't even worth responding to. So I would just like to stop right here and see uh, if uh, we could go forward. And if you have- Well, any that's, well that's, that's why I said, that's why, that's why I laugh at them. Uh, <laughs> you, talk to, you talk about the, uh, the, the amount of research uh, that was put into it. Uh, how, long, um, did, did, how long was this process uh, that you went through? When did it start? before he eventually becomes Kwanzaa in 1966? Well, I started studying African cultures uh, in college, right? Especially in community college. Then I went to UCLA and I met a lot of continental Africans, but, and I, I did self um, uh, study of uh, uh, Swahili. I chose Swahili because it was Pan-African. It's the most widely spread African language. I don't claim any ethnic group. I don't do no genealogy. I claim the whole of Africa as my heritage and all Africans as part of our extended family. So I did this research over a long period of time during college. And then when I got out of the university, I studied even more. And I did this in the early 60s. I left college, uh, I should say the university, uh, in order to join the movement, right? And when I left uh, uh, the university, uh, I'm confronted with uh, Dr. Bethune's question. She said, knowledge is the prime need of the hour, but people want to know what will you do with your knowledge? And she said, it's up to us who know to discover the dawn and then share it with the masses of our people and our youth who need it most. And so I was trying to create an institution that would laugh, that would aid the struggle. So Kwanzaa became first an act of freedom. Then it became an instrument of freedom and finally a celebration of freedom. That the freedom in that we, as a matter of self-determination, developed it. And we didn't ask permission. We didn't seek approval from city government or state government or federal government. We declared it and then practiced it and took it around the world so that now it is celebrated by millions throughout the world African community. So it was an act of freedom. And it's an act of freedom breaking away from the culture of dominance of the Europeans, right? And speaking our own special culture truth making our own unique contribution to how we understand the world and to how we imagine a new future for ourselves in humanity. And it's an instrument of, um, of freedom because it raises consciousness. It was constructed so we would engage. One of the main reasons I created Kwanzaa is so we would have a time when more than any other time we would talk about being African in the world. And what does it mean? What is our responsibility being Africans, fathers and mothers of human civilization and humanity, sons and daughters of the Holocaust of enslavement, authors and heirs of the reaffirmation of our Africanness and our social justice tradition and tradition of struggle in the 60s. What does that mean? What responsibility does it uh, uh, impose on us? And again, this Kwanzaa create this context for talking about 
Africa, the moral idea of Africa, right? The social responsibility of being African in the world. And finally, so of course, is a celebration of freedom, a celebration of us being free from, you know, restrictive um, uh, ideas that come from you. The catechism of impossibility, we broke through all that and began to speak our own special culture truth. How to settle on the seven principles? How did we do it? How to settle on the seven principles? Oh, well, I studied African cultures and I asked myself, what is the social glue and cement that holds these cultures together, which gives them the humanity, a human, a humanitarian uh, uh, character, right? And that gives them a vitality. Uh, and I, I, I settled on the idea that it was their communitarian values, right? And then I chose uh, seven because seven has a spiritual and ethical dimension in African culture, right? And it's also manageable in terms of learning, right? And so those were the things I saw, you know, Umoja, unity, Kujichagilia, self-determination, Ujima, collective work and responsibility, Ujamaa, cooperative economics, Nia, purpose, Kaumba, creativity, and Imani, faith. All of those seem to me to represent values we need to ground ourselves, orient ourselves, and use as they are being used uh, to direct our lives toward good and expansive ends. And I'm just uh, very pleased with how Black people have embraced this and how it is, as I said, become a world holiday celebrated on every continent and the world throughout the world African community. Are you surprised when you see members of Congress posting Kwanzaa messages. Now you're seeing major corporations doing commercials as well, uh, uh, touting uh, Kwanzaa? Uh, not really, because I believe that if black people embrace and speak their own special culture, Jew, and reaffirm their equality, reaffirm the fact that there's no people superior to us, no people more chosen, more, no people more holy, no people more sacred and worthy of life and a good life than us. If they stand up and do that, people respect that. And they respect the appreciation that people have for, that black people have for uh, Kwanzaa. And therefore, I would expect it. The other thing I think, Roland, is that there are two aspects to every great message, right? And you can see that in religious faith. There is a particular message that speaks to the people who created it and who first know it, right? But then it has a message also that is universal. So that Kwanzaa and the message, Kawaita message, speaks both to African people and the best of what it means to be both African and human in the fullest sense. And people can identify with that human aspect of it. So who can be against Umoja or unity? That we should have unity in our family, in our community, in our nation in our world African community. Who, who, can, who, who can deny that except haters, handmaidens and hirelings of the dominant society? And who can deny the right and responsibility of self-determination to define ourselves, to name ourselves, to create for ourselves and to speak for ourselves and to raise images above the earth that reflect our capacity for human greatness and to know it is good and to announce that it is good. Self-determination. This is a fundamental human right. It's the right of freedom. And then who can deny, Ujima, that we need to work to build the good communities, societies, and world we want and deserve to live in, right? This is so important. The same with Ujima, cooperative economic, shared work and shared wealth, right? We have to do that. We have to work and we have to share the wealth. The social wealth that we create should be more equitably distributed, not only in our community, but in the society and in the world. That's a major issue uh, with the world today. The increasing gap between the poor and the rich. It's obscene the kind of wealth that people have gotten at the suffering and oppression and occupation of other people's land and the seizure of their resources and the misuse and exploitation of labor. And we, we, we if you're a moral person, how could you? And one of the things I wanted to say, and, and, and I hope you'll let me do this, I want to just pay homage to Desmond, uh, Archbishop Desmond Tutu, y'all were talking about. And this is one of the main issues he was talking about in South Africa and the world, the gap between the rich and the poor. He was a spokesperson for the vulnerable. And we know that, 
And Kawita teaches us, and this is a fundamental conversation in Kwanzaa, that we measure the moral quality of any society by how it treats its most vulnerable people. And therefore, in our sacred text, it says, you know, give food to the hungry, water to the thirsty, clothes to the naked, and a boat to those without one. Be a father for the orphan, a mother for the timid, a caretaker for the sick, a shelter for the battered, a raft for the drowning, and a ladder for those trapped in the pit of despair. So we say that. And I like Dr. Uh, Archbishop Desmond Tutu. I met him twice, one at a reception for that Mayor Tom Bradley uh, was mayor of Los Angeles. And then we brought him to Cal State Long Beach, my, my, my university, or where I teach at. I'm professor and chair of the Department of Africana Studies there. And, and I, I enjoyed talking with him. And y'all are right. He was a man of joy and justice, right? And he reminds me of the, the Odu Ifa, sacred text of Yoruba land, ancient text, that says, let's do things with joy. For surely humans have been chosen, divinely chosen, to bring good into the world. And this is a fundamental mission and meaning of human life. And I think he embodied that. He did good with joy. And the Odu said, if you're really a good person, you love doing good. You just don't do it. Because you can do good and you taint it by the attitude you have by it. But he enjoyed doing it. And he was a spokesperson for the oppressed in every land. The gentleman that spoke about how he stood up and was even whitelisted for it, for speaking on behalf of the Palestinians, how he supported LGBTQ rights, and how he took the case of the poor and the vulnerable and the suffering people around the world and spoke a truth for them. And so we have to honor him for that. May the good, may the joy he brought and the good he left last forever. And may all his family, friends, and loved ones be blessed with consolation, courage, and peace. For surely he has risen in radiance in the heavens and now sits in the sacred circle of the ancestors among the doers of good, the righteous, and the rightfully rewarded. Hotep, I share hear it, as we say in Kawita philosophy. Let's go to my uh, panelists. Uh, first up, uh, Dr. Julian Malvo. Uh, Habari Ghani, Malana. Dr. Julian, my boy, it's so good to see you. You know, Always I was on the way to L.A. and I got to see you on Rolling. Cause, cause yeah. you, <laughs> you know, but, we were supposed to get together. We'll do it in the we, new year, okay? We'll absolutely do it. But I want to just, uh, first of all, I want to thank you. I want to thank you for Kwanzaa. I want to thank you. I try to disabuse my melanin deficient friends. This is not Black Christmas. This is something totally different. You know, when a white girl sent me a note this morning and said, Happy Kwanzaa, I just sent her the website and said, Read this. Don't send me this nonsense. Uh, she meant well, but that's not the point. Uh -huh. but, uh, <laughs> but what I want to uh, engage with you about, I just ask you about in the context of Kwanzaa and the many places that it's celebrated, uh, is the timing of it. What made you choose to put it at the end of the year is not Black Christmas, but some people see it that way. And what I see it as in some ways is an alternative to the predatory capitalist consumerism that Christmas has become. Was that part of your motivation or was there something else going on? That was a third reason. There were three main reasons. Number one, for authenticity. It's based on the Zulu uh, uh, first fruit or harvest celebration called Umkose. And it straddles the year in December and January. So it's a model. I'm always looking, it's seven days, and I'm always looking for authenticity. When I say it's African, you can believe I can demonstrate the culture grounding of it. I mean, through research and understanding and through my own interpretive practices. Then second reason I, I did it <clears throat> is because uh, the end of the year and the beginning of the year is a great time for reflection. Yes. And part of yeah. Kwanzaa, it's reflection, remembrance, reflection, and recommitment, the three fundamental practices, right? We remember the ancestors, right? We remember our past. We learn the lessons of it. We absorb the spirit of possibility inherent in it. We extract and emulate the models and mirrors of human excellence and achievement in it. And we also practice the morality of remembrance, as Fanny Lou Hamer, our foremother, taught. The two things we should all care about, never to forget where we came from, and always praise the bridges that carried us over. So this time, when it's it's a phrase in um, the Akan where they say it's a time where the edges of the year meet. 
And there's a time for deep reflection on what we've done and what we ought to be about. And the third reason, uh, as you read in my earlier writings, was a severe criticism of the commercialism of Christmas, the commercialism of Hanukkah. And I need to get behind that, to get past that and begin to ask ourselves, how do we celebrate goodness and sacredness without attaching money to it? Because uh -huh. there's, there's, there's a commodification of even worship now, right? And so I think was to move away from the capitalist conception of the consumer as a fundamental unit in society. And we say the moral person, the thinking person, the deep thinking person is a fundamental unit of society. And so we want the human being to be the fundamental unit, not the consumer. And so that means that this is built around thinking about ourselves. I say, this is our duty to know our past and honor it, to engage our present and improve it, and to imagine a whole new future and to forge it in the most ethical, effective, and expansive ways. Reverend Jeff Carr. First of all, thank you, Dr. Karenga. It's an honor to be on with you and to have this conversation and just to be able to bounce some things off you. Uh, I think we often uh, don't meditate on just how fortunate we are when we have elders like you around who are still able to share. We often think about what would Dr. King do? What would Malcolm say? What would Ida B. Wells think about the media and how it's evolved? But mm -hmm. we're blessed to have the actual founder of the holiday here. So with the digital space, we can be very, very clear. So I sure. wanted to, to ask you uh, in, in your wisdom and experience around building Kwanzaa and knowing where it started a year before I was born uh, to right now where it is, uh -huh. you've been able to observe this progress from an idea, a vision that you birthed into the world. That can be really difficult because you're still suffering through the critiques that everybody who has not birthed things into the world are hurling. Mm -hmm. But what I want to ask is this, <laughs> here in Nashville, Tennessee, I drive by the bridge and some people who celebrate Kwanzaa have convinced the mayor to light up the bridge in red, black, and green. They've been doing that the last three years. Uh, they've convinced uh, people to put displays of Kwanzaa on the public square. And yet, black people still get less than 2% of the city contracts. We still don't fill the power positions in the city, but there's an outward celebration that is becoming more mainstream. How do we, as people who support birthing new things in the world how do we maintain the legacy to make sure that people absorb the principles practice them all year and use that as an in inspirational space to prevent the commodification of the holiday thank you so much reverend i appreciate that question and if i understand it correctly it seems to me that in the final analysis all of it starts with each of us and what we need to do is first of all learn the beauty, the integrity, expansive meaning of Kwanzaa and maintain that in the way we approach it. We have to learn what it is. Sometimes black people think because they be black, they know black. They confuse sometimes. <laughs> they, they confuse ontology and epistemology, you know? Because, yes, sir. You know, and I understand it. We do know something about ourselves. But feeling pain don't make us a doctor and coming to our own conclusion don't make us a philosopher, right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Study. I'm not discrediting our, our basic knowledge. We have a knowledge and we have to appreciate the masses as an infinite source of knowledge and ability. But at the same time, we have to specialize. And when we choose to honor something, we have to embrace it and we have to defend it. We have to build a wall around it, a culture wall. You know, mm. one of the things I, I've, I've said then, we, we are vulnerable to the dominant society's culture. Mm -hmm. It's a consumerist culture. It's a capitalist culture. It's a racist culture. And what we've become, and Du Bois wrote an article right after the um, March on Washington, but when I share, and I always talk about it, he said, I'm afraid that in our efforts to integrate and just be a part of American society, then in our haste, we'll forget that we have our own special gifts. And we'll mm. begin to feel closer to Germans than to Africans. Mm. And what we have to do is make sure that we reaffirm the beauty, the sacredness the ultimate meaning of ourselves. We have to celebrate ourselves. And Kwanzaa is about celebrating ourselves. 
but it means the more you know about yourself, the more you can celebrate yourself. Mm. The more, and the more you understand yourself, the better you can assert yourself. Self-understanding and self-assertion are dialectically and inseparably linked. The greater the understanding you have of yourself, the greater the ability to assert yourself in dignity-affirming, life-enhancing, and world-preserving ways. But the less understanding you have of yourself, the less you can assert yourself in those ways. So I want people that know to share their knowledge and to begin to teach. And one of the things I had to dismiss a lot of white interviews because they want to talk to me about basic data. That's what my assistants do. They talk data. Mm -hmm. I want to talk to philosophy. But they don't want to talk for life. They want to talk about what somebody said about the holiday, about me, about my mama. I, I just I don't deal with all that. I mean, hey, you know what I mean? I'm not going to deal with that. So I told them, no, I'm not. Even, if you want to talk to philosophy, you talk for it. So that's what we need, Reverend. More than anything else, we need to stop talking the pathology of the haters, the headmates, yes, and hirelings of the dominant society and begin to say what we believe. What do we think? We mm. know what they think. The question is, what do we think? And this last point, here's what I say to our people. We have to face it. When we say African-American, remember this. We are American by habit and African by choice. And mm. we have to choose to be African every day. We get up in the morning, we don't even have to think to be American. We don't have to think to have a consumerist mind, to have a vulgarly individualistic mind. It's cultivated every day in the media. In whatever we in our educational process but we have to choose to do good in the world we have to choose to see ourselves not only as human beings but as world beings in the african set in swahili you have two words for the human being watu which is people and then walimwengu which is world being watu is human being and walimwengu is human world being so if you teach that those philosophies uh, which i say african philosophies you teach Kwanzaa what it means, how to practice, how to light the candle. Why do we choose black, red, and green? Black for the people. Why do we light the candle first? There's a whole philosophy in there. Do we light the black candle first because it shows and stresses the priority of the people? Why do mm. we have it red? The red is for struggle. The green is for future. So we light the candle first to say, without the people, nothing. Second, without struggle, there's no future. So we light first the black candle, right, in honor of our people. Right? And then we like the red candle to show our commitment to struggle, to bring good into the world. And then we like the green candle to show the promise and future that emerges from, as Mary McClellan said, our ceaseless striving and struggling. I'm a Congo. It is truly an honor uh, to be able to speak with you tonight and get all of this knowledge. I've been celebrating Kwanzaa since my for my entire life, and it, it's all I all, all I know uh, in terms of this time of year. And you know, my I know my dad is looking down right now, just just proud of what you have done for all of us. Uh, the question I have is this: I was speaking to uh, a white woman about what Kwanzaa is and and breaking it down, and she started studying it and then she said how could anybody be against the principles and the idea of what kwanzaa is and really started considering also celebrating it i was wondering if this is something that you have seen from people of other cultures we talked about you know corporate and politicians you know putting out kwanzaa greetings and the like but have you seen people of other cultures actually looking to embrace this in some way shape or form because the, even though the roots of it are african the ideals are so universal okay. appreciate what you said if i said man thank you so much for that the reality is this kwanzaa is essentially a celebration of black people a lot mm -hmm. of times people ask can other people celebrate it but they're not asking other people they don't mean do the native americans can they celebrate now the Latinos, now the Asians. You know they ask about white people, right? That's the standard, right? But the question has to be rephrased. The question is not, can white people celebrate Kwanzaa? The question is, can they celebrate black people? 
because yep. Kwanzaa is a celebration of black people. Can they celebrate the beauty and sacredness, the excellence and achievement, right? The awesome march we made through human history. Can they celebrate that? Right. If they can celebrate mm -hmm. that without trying to insinuate themselves and make them the subject of every sentence. Right. It's just like mm -hmm. so, I saw somebody send me a thing today and tried to uh, link our, 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 our Kwanzaa Kanata with the Jewish um, menorah. And I told people, stop using that. You whenever you you that's, that violates the integrity of both Hanukkah and Kwanzaa. When you mix the symbol, mm -hmm. we got enough mm -hmm. African symbols. But we don't need to imitate the Jew, mm -hmm. a menorah, but they're mm -hmm. doing it. And Microsoft always puts it out because it makes them feel they made a contribution to something black. <laughs> that mm -hmm. one of the reasons they hate on us so much is that we don't owe them anything, right? Our culture mm -hmm. is the oldest culture in the world. It is rich. I, I, I don't know how other people see it, but I see Africa as a moral idea. And that's what my mm -hmm. intellectual work, that's what my PhD in, this, in, in, in both, uh, the first PhD and the second one, is dealing with understanding Africa as a moral idea. And when I talk about, mm -hmm. I don't want to talk about modern Africa, I'm talking about the best values. I mean the moral standard by which we understand what it is to be human and how we, do we rightfully relate to the rest of the world and see ourselves embedded in the world rather than in hostile relationship with it. So mm -hmm. those things to me, I look to Africa from. Now, white people can always come to a, a public ceremony. Nobody's gonna say, get out of here. I, I, at least I wouldn't. I mean, but sometimes <laughs> when they come, sometimes when they come, black people get up and want to give them a saying. Well, are you gonna let them say anything? Why? I mean, <laughs> when I go to a Jewish a celebration of Hanukkah, tell the rabbi, sit down, give me the yarmulke, and let me conduct this service. Or let me conduct <laughs> Or when mm. I go and I say, mm. let me listen and learn what y'all are doing. Come on, Malana. Come on, Malana. People yeah. ask, can, can people absorb the Jewish thing? Or, or, or the uh, Cinco de Mayo. If I go to Cinco de Mayo to celebrate with the Mexicans, I don't try to take over the thing. But I just want us to see this. <laughs> we don't need to feel guilty for having something that celebrates us. Yes, sir. The white man has. It's like I told the uh, uh, pro, the president at our school and the dean. Y'all got a whole curriculum. Of course, it's a self. It's it's not really a curriculum. It's a self congratulatory narrative posing as a curriculum. But all of your classes are all white people, except ethnic studies. Why would y'all begrudge us? This come is on, 1460. We, we we got past AB uh, 1460, which makes it uh, mandatory, legally mandatory, that everybody, 500,000 people every year from the CSU system, have to take an ethnic studies class. And Dr. Shelley Weber should be really praised for that. Mm -hmm. And of course, we were instrumented in the struggle, first beginning the struggle at Cal State Long Beach. So I think it's very important for us to always respect other people, but insist that they respect us and that they don't need to be included in supervisorial or even leadership roles in our own just learn from us. Can you just listen to us? Mm. That's I mean, this is the last I wanted to make. I tell my colleagues, you know, whenever y'all talk Greek philosophy or anything, you know, I'm going to bring up ancient Egyptian, African American, <laughs> African. <laughs> I'm not going to. I'm not going to come to. I don't come to the table culturally naked and in need. I come fully clothed in my own culture, right? And I'm going to speak our own special culture too and make our own unique contribution to whether the subject is being discussed and engaged. So that's how I see it. There's a particular message, that's us. There's a universal message, they can embrace that. But mm -hmm. they should not mix that with the particular meaning it has for us. Asante Sana, Buana. All right. Uh, Dr. Karinga, always glad to see you looking good, uh, good looking clean. Uh, <laughs> Thank appreciate you, my you uh, dropping Thank the knowledge. Thank you. Assigned it to you. Take care. Can I just end with this? Yeah, go ahead. To all of us listening, head is our Kwanzaa, happy Kwanzaa. And remember this, as I said earlier, this is our duty to know our past and honor, to engage our present and improve it. 
and to imagine a whole new future, to forge it in the most ethical, effective, and expansive way. And this to continue the struggle, keep the faith, hold the line, love and respect our people and each other, practice the Nguzo Saba, the seventh principle, seek and speak truth, do and demand justice, be constantly concerned with the well-being of the world and all in it, and dare help rebuild the overarching movement that prefigures and makes possible the good world we all want and deserve to live in and lead as a legacy worthy of the name and history of Africa. Happy Kwanzaa. Head is that Kwanzaa. And we're going to do all of that. Doc, <laughs> appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Take Thank care. You. Take care. Dr. Oh, Dr. Oh, my uncle's video in just one moment. to be smart. Roland Martin's doing this every day. Oh, no punches! Thank you, Roland Martin, for always giving voice to the issues. Look for Roland Martin in the whirlwind, to quote Marcus Garvey again. The video looks phenomenal, so I'm really excited to see it on my big screen. Support this man, Black Media. He makes sure that our stories are told. See, this difference between Black Star Network and Black-owned media and something like CNN. I got to defer to the brilliance of Dr. Carr and to the brilliance of the Black Star Network. I am rolling with rolling all the way. Honored to be on a show that you own. A Black man <laughs> owns the show. Folks, Black Star Network is here. I'm real uh, revolutionary right now. Like, wow. Rolling was amazing on that. Stay Black. I love y'all. I can't commend you enough about this platform that you've created for us to be able to share who we are, what we're doing in the world, and the impact that we're having. Let's be smart. Bring your eyeballs home. You can't be black on media and be scared. You dig?